Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Awesome. All right, does anyone have any questions about anything so far? I'll take that as a note. So if, if there's no questions, we'll just carry on where we were last time. And this is the PowerPoint we left off on. So just to recap, um, we talked about how prokaryotes uh, do cellular division. Um, they do a process called binary fission. Um, we're not really sure how this works, but remember that you guys need to know that it involves uh, an origin of replication, which is, we'll talk about this in detail later on, but it's just the place where uh, the DNA opens. Remember, DNA is double stranded and bacteria have a circular chromosome. So I'm just drawing two strands. This would be a helix, just like our DNA. And then there's a, a DNA sequence right here called the ORI, or origin of replication. Bacteria have one a single origin of replication. Um, it's usually made up of A's and T's and instead of G's and C's. Do you guys know why that is? Can you guess? So think about the number of hydrogen bonds these have that we learned in chapter five. How many hydrogen bonds in A's and T's? Does anyone remember? So there's two, and in G's and C's, how many hydrogen bonds are there? Anyone remember? Three. So <clears throat> which one of these do you think are, are harder to break? Three hydrogen bonds or two hydrogen bonds? Three. Right, and so you wanna have an area of DNA that's easy to open, easy to break those bonds. And that's why origins of replication have lots of A's and T's so that it's easy to open up. It takes less energy. So that's basically what we know about this. And for the test, you need to know bacteria use binary fission and that they their replication uh, divides at the origin and then that moves to opposite ends of the cell before they split into two. Then we talked about the variation of how, so this is the main way we talked about for the whole chapter about my uh, mitosis. And remember in mitosis, we wanna make exact copies. And then diatoms, they, the nucleus stays intact, uh, which is different than what we learned. And also in dinoflagellates, the nucleus remains intact. The difference between these two is that the, the centric, centrosome centrioles that make up the centrosomes which are the where those microtubules are built uh, here they're built inside the nucleus the microtubules originate and here they originate on the outside of the nucleus but in both cases the nuclear membrane remains intact so that's this purple thing here Whereas in all other organisms, the nucleus comes apart uh, so that it, these uh, centrioles and centrosomes have access to the chromosomes. All right, so just make sure you know that for the exam. And just you just need to know the, the three variants, the dinoflagellates, the diatoms, and the binary fission that bacteria use. All right. So, is it question? Okay. So it, the regulation of the cell cycle is super important. We talked about the cell cycle is like a pizza that's cut into four slices. And we have uh, the rest, which is Z, G0. So these are cells that are rest, at rest. Um, so like right now, your liver cells, it's, I assume all of you guys are adults. Uh, then uh, your liver is not getting any bigger. So the cells aren't dividing. So that we would say those cells are in G0 or at rest. Um, now, if you were to get a liver transplant, 
they would remove your liver and then they would find a donor. And what that donor would do is they would take the liver and they would cut their liver in half. So the recipient, let's say you would get half a liver and then the person that's donating it would keep a half a liver. And so once that's done, you don't have to live with a half size liver. The cells start going through the cell cycle. So they have to go through G1, which means they have to make sure there's enough nutrients to go to the next phase, which is replication or S, which is synthesis. That's what it stands for, but it's where the DNA is copied. And then they have to go through G2, which is essentially to check the DNA to make sure it's copied right. And then remember there's two options here. So either you go, if the DNA is not copied right, you can't uncopy it. So the cell will kill itself. Do you remember what that term is called? Apoptosis. Apoptosis. Yeah. So the cell will kill itself if it can't fix the DNA because it's better to do that than to pass on mutations. And if everything's cool, then it'll go on to M phase. So this is basically the cell cycle. And make sure you guys know the parts of this. And then all of this stuff out here besides M phase has a name, it's called interphase. And you need to know that too. Um, so make sure you know G0, G1, S, G2, and the purpose of those, and that all of those are interphase. And then M phase, um, is the mitosis phase, which we uh, basically covered as uh, prophase, um, prometaphase. So you'll need to know each of these and what the events are metaphase, uh, anaphase, and telophase, and then cytokinesis. All right. <clears throat> so there is a system that that controls this. So, so the cells know, like when the liver is divided in half, when you get a, a liver transplant, they the they know that they don't they're not the right size. They don't have neighbors, and they know to start going through this cell cycle to make new cells, so that the liver will continue to grow into a full size liver. And in the end both you and the donor <clears throat> would end up with a, with a full-size liver <clears throat> through a whole bunch of cells going through the cell cycle to make new cells. Um, and, and so this checkpoint, this G2 checkpoint where it checks the DNA, this doesn't occur uh, when you're uh, in your mother's womb. So when you're you, you wouldn't be called a larva, you'd be called an embryo or maybe a fetus. But either way, the, there's not enough time, nine months is not enough time to go through this cell cycle rigorously to make sure that the DNA is copied correctly because you have to go from one cell to a trillion cells and be born in nine months if we're talking about humans. Uh, if the DNA got checked through that whole period, then it would take about three years for you to be born and your mom would be really pissed off about that. So the DNA doesn't go through this rigorous check. And that's why when you're an embryo or a fetus or a larva, uh, it's, real, it's real dangerous to ingest things that can damage DNA. because it, there's no check uh, here. So if anything is introduced that damaged DNA, like if you smoked during your pregnancy or drank or laid out in the sun, I mean, the sun probably wouldn't penetrate to the fetus. It would just affect you, but, you know, or if you uh, went around digging for uranium, radioactive uranium, all that stuff would get passed on to all of the cells. So let's say your first cell gets damage on it, well, every cell that comes after that would have that exact same damage because there's no checkpoint in larva. Once you're born, that this checkpoint turns on in G2 to check the DNA. 
and and if it detects something's wrong and undergoes apoptosis, that's a way to prevent uh, cancers from occurring because you guys know that cancer comes from mutations, which is basically what would happen if you went, your DNA got messed up and it went on to make new cells. So the cell cycle is really important to cancer biologists. Uh, and I'll explain to the, that uh, in a little more detail uh, in, in the following slides. So here's a drawing from your book, and this is basically what I just drew out. It, the only thing it doesn't have is the G0 point, which is right here, the rest point. So we have G1, we talked about that. That's to make sure that we can double in size, like my example of the, the Play-Doh. If you kept cutting it in half, it would get smaller and smaller and smaller. So you've got to roughly double in size. Um, and if, you, if there's not enough food and stuff in the environment, then you, you wouldn't be able to do that. So the cell would detect that and it would hold, it, hold the cell cycle at what we call the G1 checkpoint. So it's just the purpose of this is to check for the level of nutrients. And the reason is once you go through S phase, you can't undo it. So you're committed. Once you get past this G1, you're committed to go through the cell cycle or die. That's it. There's only two options. And we'll kill yourself, apoptosis. So uh, if there's not enough nutrients available, you don't want to start the cell cycle. And we... Uh, cancer biologists can get cells. Um, it, like let's say we extracted cells from a tumor, they they might be in different phases of the cell cycle all at the same time. If I want them to cycle together, I just starve them. You know, so I just give them the bare minimum they need to live, and every cell in that petri dish will stop right here. And then I add food. You know, I won't get into what all this is, but it's basically sugars and proteins and that sort of amino acids, that sort of stuff. And then they'll start all cycling together. So I can study all the cells in the same phase of the cell cycle at the same time. And so that's how we can get uh, all cells to start cycling through the cell cycle at the same time. All right, so S phase, pretty simple. It's the, the DNA is replicated. We talked about that several times. And once you do that, you can't undo it. And you can't survive with twice as much DNA. So you're committed. Then we have the G2. Remember the purpose of the G2 is to make sure that the DNA is copied correctly. So the DNA is right. There's no mutation because mitosis, we want identical cells. And this G2 checkpoint does that. So there's a protein called P53. I don't care if you know this or not, but I'm just gonna tell you, P53 is a been mutated in cancer, so it doesn't work anymore. So cancer cells don't have like a bouncer at the club. So uh, everybody gets in. There's no apoptosis going on. That means all mutations are passed on. So if you have a cancer cell, right, it's automatically, even if, the, even if it's messed up, it's automatically going to make new cells. And those new cells are going to be messed up. And again, we get more and more mutation. So cancer is a really tough disease because the first cell is way different than the cells that are outside of the tumor. Let's say this is the tumor. So the original cells may have a couple mutations. This might have a couple more. So we have four. This might have twice as many and so on. So you could have hundreds of different mutations of cells on the outside of the tumor as on the inside. And so they all look different. And that's really and that makes it really hard to fight cancer because it's a hetero, what we call a heterogeneous disease. It's not just one. Uh, one thing that we can target. It's lots of these mutations that are continuously accumulating. And then uh, eventually the mutations will get so bad that the cells don't stay together and then they travel off. Let's say the 
lung, this is a lung cell, a lung tumor, the mutations that tell lung cells to stay with other lung cells get so bad that it doesn't recognize lung cells and then it might go to the brain. And now you have lung cells in your brain and that's not gonna help your brain uh, to function. It's gonna hinder it. It would be the same thing as shoving an ice pick into your head. So uh, new uh, clinical trials to fight cancer are reintroducing P53 artificially or trying to repair this gene. So then it says, wait a second, what's going on here? And then it starts, it starts telling all these cells to undergo apoptosis, kind of like if the bouncer left the club and went to the bathroom and like found all this riffraff inside and said, all of you guys get out. Um, and so it seems very promising to reintroduce this gene to allow the, the your own cell system, the cell cycle, to kill cancer cells because they're severely mutated. All right, so on the test, you need to know what's the G1 checkpoint for. Can you guys tell me? So it's to make sure that the cell is big enough and there's enough nutrients to go through the process of the cell cycle. What's the G2 checkpoint for? DNA. Yeah, to check the DNA to make sure it's okay. And what if it's not? What if it can't be fixed? Apoptosis. Yeah, and what if it can? It goes on to uh, M. Yes, excellent, that's exactly right. All right, so we didn't talk about this M checkpoint yet, but there is an M checkpoint. And the M checkpoint, remember in, in mitosis, we have all of these sister chromatids lined up at the metaphase plate. And then we have these microtubules that are attached to them, right? So what happens if a microtubule isn't attached correctly? Let's say this is what the cell looked like. And then it went through M phase to anaphase. So you guys know in anaphase, this separates. Well, these two would separate because they're attached to microtubules, but this one's not attached. So we would end up with a cell that had three chromosomes in it on this side, and a cell that had one chromosome on the other side. And that would be bad because I can tell you as a cancer biologist that most cancer cells have multiple chromosomes. Um, and so we, we wanna make sure all of the chromosomes are attached at the kinetic cores. And if you guys don't remember this, you can just go back a few slides or we'll go last lecture. They have to be connect, attached to the kinetic cores. Remember the kinetic cores are, it's just a DNA sequence on the outside that attracts a protein. And once they're attached, then it can go through to the next phase. So the M checkpoint occurs in metaphase. Sorry, that black is there, but that's metaphase. All right, so G1 checkpoint, is the environment good? Is the cell big enough? Um, and then the, the G2 is, is all the DNA replicated right? Um, and any one of these things are wrong, it will stop the cell cycle until it can fix it or until the cell dies. So in M phase, remember all the chromosomes condense. So all of the genes are closed like a, like a scroll. And so all the important genes that do like glycolysis and make your ATP, those are all shut down. So you can only sit in M phase for a little while. And so let's, I just want you to think about this. So I'm, I'm not really gonna, I'm just looking for a blank canvas here for a second. So we have, we have cells uh, that are in, in M phase. And we know that we have prophase and we have 
pro, metaphase, and then we have metaphase. And then metaphase, we have that, that M checkpoint. And remember, M checkpoint makes wants to make sure that all of the sister chromatids are attached to microtubules so that they get divided evenly. And if they're not, right, then it will stop the cell cycle. So a lot of, you guys heard of chemotherapy drugs to treat cancer. So a lot of chemotherapy drugs will interfere with microtubules to prevent them from being formed. So if microtubules aren't formed, what happens in the, in my, in the mitosis phase at the M, M checkpoint? Chromosomes can't separate. Right, and so what happens to the cell cycle? It stops. Yes, and if it stops long enough, the cells can't make ATP, and what happens to the cancer cells? They die. Yes, so that's the whole purpose of chemotherapeutic drugs is to stop the cell cycle in M phase, well, there are other ones that do other things, but the majority of the ones that are used today stop the cell cycle in M phase to kill cancer cells. The problem is, is that all of your cells that are dividing, right? All cells that are dividing are going through M phase. So it's gonna kill cancer cells, but what about other cells that are going through the cell cycle? It would kill them too, right? Yeah, it, they all die. And so that's why you get these terrible side effects from chemotherapy. Like your skin cells are constantly dividing and the cells that line your uh, digestive system. So you, you ever had a sun? I don't know you guys ever had a sunburn? <coughs> well, so a sunburn is caused by your cells that are undergoing apoptosis in your skin. And you know what that feels like, right? So the cells are dying. Now, Imagine that you're a cancer patient and you're taking a chemotherapeutic drug that's killing all the cells in your digestive system. What do you think that feels like? Horrible. It feels like a sunburn in the inside of your throat and in your uh, mouth and in your uh, stomach and in your small intestines. So that would that make you want to eat food? No. Yeah, because it's painful. So it's it kind of it's kind of a sucky way to treat cancer, and we're going to talk a little bit about ways that we can treat cancer, maybe in the future that aren't so harmful to, to the other cells that you know are constantly being replaced. So we talked about this slide here is talking about um, the G1 checkpoint and G0. I'm going to switch to red because that's easier to see. I got G1. Remember, the purpose of G1, and make sure you guys know this for the test, is to make sure that there's enough nutrients. So it doesn't, so all the cells stop, right? And then G0, what's G0? Resting. Yeah, that's the rest phase. So most of your cells are in G0, right? Um, like your brain cells aren't dividing. Your liver cells aren't dividing. Your lungs aren't getting bigger. Uh, your kidneys aren't getting bigger. Most of those cells are in G0. So there are some cells that are never in G0, like skin, digestive system, uh, cells in, in your lung and uh, that line your lungs, the, the, those or whatever. Um, but even if the cells are in G0, sometimes they can be called out of G0 to go through the cell cycle. And we talked about the liver you know, in a liver transplant. But some cells are always in G0 and rest, and we don't really even know how to get them out of rest. So nerve cells, specialized muscle cells, um, a lot of, you know, we talk, I, we already talked about this, but like people that, scientists and doctors that study, study like spinal injuries, they're real interested in the cell cycle because imagine if you could get nerve cells to go through the cell cycle again. Um, and at some point they work because otherwise you wouldn't have a spinal cord. Uh, 
then we can regrow uh, nerve tissue and like help people that were, you know, let's say quadriplegic or paraplegic, they, they would be able to walk again. And that would be re a really big advancement. Um, you know, and, 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 and some muscle cells and we could repair those too. And we talked about this, some cells are never in G0, like skin, digestive, hair. So for the test, I'm gonna ask you to give me examples of some cells that are always in G0 and some cells that are never in G0. So these are always in rest and these are never in rest. All right. So this, I don't think this animation is gonna play because of the Adobe update or whatever, but um, so this is just a recap. This is kind of backwards from what I've been drawing it, but it's still okay. So G0 usually is drawn here, but the artist that did this put it in the middle of G1 and that's fine, I don't really care. Because before it's it's it really is just before the G1 checkpoint. Could, it could be anywhere. So, so all of this is the same, right? The cells are not growing uh, or whatever. In order to pass G1 checkpoint, the cell has to roughly double in size to prepare for cell division. And then we have synthesis. And what's that for? If I ask you on the test, make sure you guys know this. So S is for DNA replication. We'll talk about this in chapter 16, how this works on a molecular level. And there's no checkpoint here until we get to G2. And this checkpoint here is called the G2 check. Checkpoint, it's my check symbol. And that, what's the purpose of that? So that's to make sure DNA is copied correctly. And then if it is, it goes on to mitosis. And then we have that M phase checkpoint. And what's the purpose of that? That's to see if it's um, if like the microtubules are in place. Yeah, that's to make sure that all the chromosomes are attached to the microtubules correctly so that we get an even division. Uh, the same number of uh, chromosomes get put in each daughter cell. So that's that's basically the cell cycle. Um, all right, so there are some things that help regulate the cell cycle. Do you guys remember what kinases are? I told you you need to know those. Do you know what a kinase does? It's an enzyme. It is an enzyme. That's right, because it is an ASU. That's perfect. What does it do? Is that working with the substrate? And well, all enzymes have a substrate, but in this case, kinases have a specific job, and their job is to add a phosphate. So make sure you guys know that for the test. I'm going to ask you what a kinase is. You know, all enzymes are. Uh, protein. So this is kind of redundant saying a protein kinase, because if you just say kinase, it's automatically a protein. Um, so remember when we add a phosphate to a molecule, what does it do to that molecule? Changes the shape. Yeah. And, and hopefully over the course of this class, you guys realize that we can change the shape to make something turn on right from the enzyme chapter or we could change the shape to make something turn off. And so that's what kinases do. Their job is to turn these proteins or these enzymes on or off by adding a phosphate. And so uh, I'm gonna talk about the, the, the way the cell cycle works is with kinases and another protein called cyclin. So, so, the, so there's a thing called a cyclin dependent kinase. 
And so the word tells you what it is. It's a kinase that's dependent on what? Cyclin. Cyclin. So cyclin is a protein. And it's called cyclin because during the cell cycle, so we have G1, uh, S, G, T, M phase. Make sure you guys can draw this out. You should be able to draw this out. I've drawn this like five times now. So cyclins, they, they vary in the amount that exist in each phase. So if we were going to say like this is G1 and then this is S and this is G2, they cycle through the cell cycle. So they get, there's a lot of them maybe in G1 and a little in S and a lot in G2 and maybe a little in M. And so these two work together. This thing's job, what's a kinase's job? Add a phosphate. Add a phosphate, but it doesn't have the right shape to do that without the cyclin. That's why it's called the cyclin dependent kinase. The cyclin has to be there for the kinase to work. So here, the cyclin's low. So will the cyclin dependent kinase work? No. No. But here, the, the cyclin's high. So will the kinase work here? Yes. You guys get the gist of it? So here it wouldn't work, here it would. All right. So we call them CDKs for short because scientists are lazy. We don't like to write out stuff. So we use abbreviations. <clears throat> so this is how it works. Um, this is just an example of the G2 checkpoint. Remember we talked about that? What's the purpose of G2? So it's right after S. It's a DNA check. Yes, DNA check. Awesome. Perfect. So the way that this works, the DNA check, there's a cyclin in the cell that it starts to accumulate in G2. And that cyclin, um, is called cyclin B in humans. So this is cyclin B, and there's different kinds of cyclins. So I, I kind of wrote the cyclins here. We have cyclin A, cyclin B, cyclin D, cyclin E, and there's more that are being discovered, but essentially that's the main ones. So cyclin B is the cyclin, and then we have the cyclin dependent kinase. In this case, remember proteins are specific for what they bind to. So this one has a shape. The artist drew this little bump here to show that these only these two fit together. So only cyclin B is going to fit with this cyclin dependent kinase, which is called CDC2 in humans. And once cyclin is built up, and the cyclin dependent kinase is always there. So at this point, the two come together and it makes a functional uh, cyclin, uh, I'm sorry, a functional kinase called mitosis pr promoting factor. And what do you think that does? Promotes mitosis? <laughs> yeah. So if, this, if these two are present, then it will go on to the mitosis phase. And what if they're not? What if something's wrong with this cyclin? What would happen? Apoptosis. It could, or it could, it could cause it to just sit here at the G2 checkpoint. And it would stop, stop the cell cycle. And so this is how the cell advances um, from one stage to another. So you know how the chromosomes get shorter and fatter? They get twisted. What do you think does that? Phosphates? Right, and if the phosphate, if the if the kinase isn't present, the phosphates don't occur, so the chromosomes can't condense, so you can't go through M phase. So these cyclins are really important, oh, along with their their kinases, to progress through each step of the cell cycle. So for the test, I want you guys to know where mitosis promoting factor is found. 
and that's in the G2 checkpoint, right? You need to know that mitosis promoting factor promotes mitosis from G2, and that it's made up of a cyclin-dependent kinase called CDC2 in humans, and the cyclin's name is cyclin B. So you need to know all of that. Um, and that, when all that's present, it, go, it allows the cell go, to go from G2 to M phase so that we continue through the cell cycle. Um, it's necessary for the transition uh, out of M phase to G1 as well. Not this particular cyclin, but another one. We're going to talk about that in the next slide, which is anaphase promoting complex. So what do you think this promotes? The anaphase cycle. What's right before anaphase? See if you guys know this yet. Metaphase? Yeah, that's exactly right. So remember in metaphase, we have that M checkpoint. And so in metaphase, that's where all the chromosomes line up in the middle and all the microtubules have to be attached. So if they're not attached, then the cyclin doesn't get built. And so what happens if there's no cyclin? Because the, chromos the chromosomes aren't attached to the spindle, the microtubules. No cyclin. What happens? No mitosis. Well, we're in mitosis, but we don't, we stop in metaphase in mitosis until the cyclin's built. And the cyclin won't be built until all the microtubules are attached. So uh, we can halt the cell cycle in M phase. And once they're all attached, the cyclin's made, and that binds to the cyclin dependent kinase. And then once they're together, it promotes the next phase, which is anaphase, right? So remember we have prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So the anaphase promoting complex is a cyclin and a cyclin dependent kinase that phosphorylates that basically dissolves uh, what's holding these chromosomes together. Kind of like uh, acetone and superglue. And so now they're free to go to opposite ends of the cell. And that's how that works. We talked about the kinetic cores have to be attached and then that activates the anaphase promoting complex. I have a question. Sure. Um, during that checkpoint, is it only one chance for that cyclin to activate for it to go on or does it wait there and hang on? It, it'll wait there for a while, but remember <clears throat> all of your genes are turned off. Uh, so the genes are off. Once the chromosomes condense and, and, and prophase, it's like rolling up a scroll. So you can't read the genes anymore, right? Because the chromosomes are 50,000 times uh, condensed uh, so that we can separate them, kind of like the example I said with the headphones in a gym bag. So the, the, you can only live so long with your genes turned off. So it will sit here for a while, um, but eventually the cell will run out of energy. You know, you're gonna have some proteins that are gonna sit around and, and, and function, but once those proteins break down, um, and remember, everything breaks down, and we learn that from the laws of thermodynamics, like everything tends towards disorder. So that means your proteins can only last so long in the cell. And once those proteins, like uh, an example of this would be like uh, ones in glycolysis, you know, so if these proteins aren't there, you can't do glycolysis. And if you can't do glycolysis, you can't make ATP. And if you can't make ATP, what happens? You die. So it really depends on how long these proteins can 
managed to uh, to uh, stop the the second law of thermodynamics, which is everything tends towards disorder or everything everything breaks down, right? Your car breaks down, the pyramids get old, you get old, you know. Uh, does that answer your question? It can it can stay there for a while, but once your proteins start failing, then the cell will die. Yeah, yeah. Because we can't make any new proteins until we <clears throat> until we get through M phase. We have to go through telophase and then the chromosomes uncondense and then they can start making new proteins. So only how long these proteins can survive in the cell is how long it can sit in M phase. And that that's a trick that cancer biologists use to kill cancer cells, but it also kills all other cells. All right, so just to make sure that you guys know what's on the test, make sure that you know, you don't need to know all the cyclins, just this one from mitosis promoting factor. Remember, this is in G2. It's called mitosis promoting factor, or MPF. It's made up of the cyclin dependent kinase. Remember, kinase is adiphosphate, called CDC2 and the cyclin called cyclin B. There are other cyclins, but I don't want you to learn those. I just want you to learn one, so you kind of get an idea of an example of how this works. And then you should know anaphase promoting complex. It works the same way, but I'm not gonna make you know the cyclin and the cyclin dependent kinase involved in this, but it works just like the mitosis promoting factor. I don't know why they call one a factor and one a complex, but somebody did it and it just stuck. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can find a, a YouTube video. So uh, it's kind of um, easier to see the cell cycle in action. Um, and then you can kind of see what's going on. Um, I haven't, I haven't, <clears throat> excuse me, I haven't seen this amoeba sister one, so I don't know if this is good, but it has a lot of use. So let's see if this kind of explains it. The WGU is a federal? Yes, WGU is a credited by both national and regional accredited. That means WGU's degrees are respected by employers. On average, WGU grads see salary increases of $12,000 for two years of graduation and $20,000 for four years. Plus, 96% of employers who have hired WGU grads said they would hire another. Yet, most WGU degrees are about half the cost of the national average with flexible online courses that fit your schedule. Learn more today. Have you ever been sitting in a car and thought to yourself, I wonder what most people are doing right now at this very moment? This kind of pondering may be the wouldn't we at some point wonder what our cells are doing right now? Because if you remember, as part of the cell theory, you are made of cells. All living things are made of one or more cells. Many multicellular organisms like you have cells that work together, working together as part of a body tissue, body tissues working together as part of an organ, organs working together as part of an organ system. Your cells are specialized to work in these different levels of organization. You have skin cells, stomach cells, muscle cells, just to name a few, and their functions need to be regulated. These cells actually are regulated as part of something called the cell cycle. And that is going to relate to my question of, I wonder what my cells are doing right now. Cells themselves can grow in size, but let's put it in perspective now. A multicellular organism isn't growing because each individual cell is getting bigger. A multicellular organism itself grows by making more cells, by the cells making more cells by dividing. That's cell reproduction. One reason that you're bigger than you were when you were five, unless you are five, is because your cells have divided to make more cells. Mitosis and the cytokinesis that follows that split the cytoplasm allows you to make new body cells, but you don't want that cell division happening all the time. 
Why? It is likely that you've heard the term cancer before. We have had family members that have battled cancer before. It is definitely a relevant topic for all of us. Cancer is in part due to cells that divide too frequently. The cells are not regulated. They are uncontrolled. Cancer cells can have other problems too. They might not be able to communicate with other healthy cells. They may not be able to carry out normal cell functions. They may not securely anchor themselves like other cells do, which can make them more likely to travel somewhere else. Some cancer cells have the ability to secrete their own growth hormone that makes blood vessels divert over to those cancer cells and supply the cancer cell with nutrients, which can take nutrients away from healthy cells. Why do cancer cells become this way? Well, there's a lot of research in this area. With some cancers, there may be genetic links, making some cells more susceptible to having problems. These genetic factors might run in families. Exposure to toxins, radiation, excessive exposure to UV lights, all of these can be risk factors for some cells to become cancerous. The uncontrolled growth that cancer cells have gives rise to more cells like them, which can develop into a tumor. Some tumors stay put, but some do not. Now, the good news is that scientists continue to develop better treatments, which include destroying the cancer cells with radiation or medication, such as chemotherapy, which will target cells that divide frequently. Maybe someday you will be part of helping to meet the challenge of trying to eliminate cancer, because the fact remains that these cells are not participating in the cell cycle like they should. So what is the cell cycle? The cell cycle is often represented in a pie chart like this. Cells are either in one of two different phases, a phase called interphase, where the cells themselves are growing, replicating their DNA, doing their cell functions, or they are in M phase, which includes mitosis and the actual splitting of the cytoplasm, cytokinesis. So this M phase is where cells actually divide to make more cells, but cells spend most of their time in interphase. So most of the time, they're not dividing. Now, depending on what kind of cell, it might do mitosis more or less often. For example, your hair follicle cells do mitosis frequently, which is why your hair can grow at the rate that it does. It's also why many cancer drugs may also target hair follicle cells because many cancer drugs go after cells that do cell division frequently. It's a big deal for cells to hit this end phase. If a cell has an error, a harmful mutation, for example, you do not want it to divide because then it will create another cell that has this same issue. That's where checkpoints come in handy. Along the cell cycle, there are checkpoints to check that the cell is growing well and replicating its DNA correctly and doing everything it's supposed to do correctly before it divides. To better understand those checkpoints, let's further divide the cell cycle pie chart. We have G1, S, G2. All three of those are part of interphase. Then we have M phase where mitosis will happen. During G1, the cell individually itself grows. Then it replicates its DNA in S phase you can remember that because the S is for synthesis, which means to make something, and it's making DNA. Then G2, the cell grows some more in preparation for mitosis. So let's take a look at checkpoints. We've got one here in G1. This checkpoint checks, is the cell growing well enough? Is its DNA damaged? Because if it is, you definitely don't want it to move on to S phase where it would replicate DNA. Does the cell have the resources it needs if it were to keep moving on? This checkpoint in G2 checks if the DNA was replicated correctly back in S phase. Is it growing well enough? Does it have the resources it needs to contend? Okay, then moving on. This next checkpoint in M phase is my favorite checkpoint. It checks in the stage metaphase to make sure the chromosomes, which are made of DNA, are lined up in the middle correctly, that they're all attached to the spindle correctly, because if they're not, the chromosomes will not be separated correctly. So now you may have two big questions. First, what happens if the cell doesn't meet the requirements of the checkpoint? And second, what is doing the regulating of this cycle anyway? To address the first question, if the reason the cell can't go past the checkpoint is a reason that can be fixed, the cell may kind of pause here until it can fix that issue. But if it can't be fixed, then the cell does something called apoptosis which basically means the cell self-destructs. This ensures that a cell that is damaged beyond repair will not go on to divide. 
So what is doing the regulating anyway? We've mentioned before that proteins are a big deal. Genes in your body can code for proteins that do an assortment of functions. And there are many proteins involved with regulating the cell cycle. Some of them are positive regulators because they allow moving forward in the cycle. And some are negative regulators that might make things stop. The proteins themselves can be sensitive to cues inside and outside of the cell. So for example, two proteins that are involved in positive regulation are cyclin and CDK. CDK is specifically an enzyme protein, a fancy kind called a kinase, which is worth a Google. CDK can have different forms of cyclin protein bound to it. Different types of cyclin rise and fall throughout the cell cycle. And the rising and falling is based on a variety of signals to determine when the cell should move on to the next cell cycle phase. Typically, each cell cycle phase, G1, S, G2, M, will tend to have a different cyclin binding with the CDK. The rise and fall of cyclin types and the role CDK has when it's active is a fascinating subject to explore. Remember that vocabulary word we said, apoptosis? Proteins that are negative regulators, for example, a protein called P53, can be involved in initiating apoptosis. Again, we encourage you to explore beyond the video. One last thing to mention. There are some cells that don't go through the phases we mentioned because they're actually in G0. That's a zero, by the way, and not a no, because if it was an O, then it's a go, and G0 is kind of the opposite of that. G0 is a resting phase. Now, cells here are still performing cell functions, but they're not preparing to divide. Some cells go here temporarily, maybe if there's not enough resources around, for example. But some, like many types of neurons in your brain and spinal cord, may stay here permanently. If they stay here permanently, they'll never get to end phase, so they will not divide. This can be one reason why a major injury to the brain or spinal cord can have challenges with healing, as many of those cells may not be able to replicate, a topic that definitely continues to be researched. Well, that's it for the Meba Sisters, and remind you to stay curious. <laughs>
grow on the bottom of the dish. They, they're what we call they anchor to the bottom. And it's, it's much like they anchor to uh, your extracellular matrix, your tissue. And, and they continue to grow until they make what we call a confluent line, which is basically the entire bottom of the dish is covered with cells. And normal cells stop dividing then. Once they're attached and they cover the bottom, they know that they have neighbors. And so that the cell cycle stops here because it knows that there's no space to grow, right? This would be the equivalent of like you got a cut in your uh, skin or some muscle tissue and the cells would grow to fill in that area that you cut. And then once they filled it in, they would stop. Uh, and if you cut yourself again, then they would do the same thing. They would grow until that's filled in and they would stop. And that's normal. That's how normal cells function. But so this is density dependent, right? They know they have neighbors. They have to be at the bottom of the dish, not floating around like in your blood. Um, so they, they have to be attached to something and, and they know they have neighbors. So attached to a Petri dish or inside your body to the, the extracellular matrix that we learned about um, and that they have neighbors and that's normal. But in cancer cells, they don't, they don't do that. So cancer cells, they don't care if they're floating in your blood or not, they continue to divide. And this is when it gets dangerous because they're moving from the original tumor uh, throughout your body to like set up shop somewhere else. Like we talked about lung cells could spread to the brain and that would interfere with your brain, kind of like, you know, the same way uh, sticking an object in your brain would interfere with it. And, and they also don't care if they have neighbors. So a tumor is caused by uncontrolled growth. Cancer cells, they, they don't care uh, if there's space or not, they continue to divide. And so cancer cells are always going, they're always green lighting the cell cycle um, because there's something wrong with them and it, it has to do with genes. And so I, we're gonna talk a little bit about cancer, but I just want you to know that cancer is a complex disease and that's why it's really hard to cure. We talked about how the cells in the center of the tumor are way different than the cells on the outside. They have different genetics. from one another and all these other cells in this tumor, like here, this cell has a different genetic makeup than this cell because there's no checks of mutations. So these are heterogeneous. There's a big mix of different uh, types of cells in here. Um, but cancers do have lots of things in common. The first thing is that they make tumors which is uncontrolled cell growth. The second thing is that makes them dangerous is that they spread. So when they spread, we call it metastasis. I know it's a fancy word, but remember, uh, 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 well, anyway, I, I don't wanna get in, into the roots of, the, of this, but metastasis means that the cancer cells can move. So this is growth uncontrolled growth, and we call that tumor genesis. And then metastasis means that they can move. So they've lost their weight. So now they're spreading. And this is, this is what you might call a benign tumor. And this is what you would call a malignant tumor, right? And you know, you're, if you went in and your doctor said, oh, your tumor is benign, then you wouldn't worry too much about it. But benign tumors can become malignant. Um, and so this could be a concern depending on uh, the genetic makeup of that cell. The next thing is, and like you saw in the video, that cancer, once it spreads, it has the ability to get blood 
to increase blood flow to it. And we call this angiogenesis. Angio is blood and genesis is uh, to create. And then uh, the last thing is that cancer cells or are immortal. So most of your cells divide a certain number of times. If I took, and I've done this before, if I took skin cells out of, a, of you and I put them in a Petri dish, I, would, I could grow them and they would divide about 50 times and then they would undergo apoptosis just on their own. Just because of that second law of thermodynamics, they get tired, they get old, uh, they're kind of, we'll talk about in chapter 16, there's another reason that it, it's because your DNA shortens, but regardless, that's what happens. In cancer cells, if I take a cancer, so just to give you an example, I have cancer cells from 1972 in, in the lab at MCC that are still growing. As long as I feed them, they continue to divide. So they have undergone millions of divisions and they don't follow this normal cell guideline where you divide so many times and you die. So they're immortal. And so a lot of things have to go wrong for cancer to be bad, right? First of all, the cell cycle has to get screwed up so that it continues to go, right? And makes a tumor. Then you have to accumulate so many mutations that the cells don't know to stay with other cells like them. So they spread around in the body. Then you have to develop mutations that allow the cancer to generate blood vessels. So let's say that the tumor never spread. Well, then your doctor, if you're at level one, your doctor could just cut it out, no big deal. Now the tumor spread, right? So now you've got a lot of the same tumors all over the place. Some of them may be hard to actually operate on. So that could be an issue. Um, but if they never spread, it's not a big deal. Even if they did spread, let's say the lung cells went to the brain, if they couldn't get blood, what would happen to those cells? They would die, right? They couldn't get oxygen. They couldn't get glucose. So they have to be able to recruit these blood vessels. And then even if they did all that, even if they could do all of these steps, one, two, and three, they, if, if they only divided like 50 times like normal cells and then killed themselves, then it wouldn't be a big deal because it would just be a temporary thing. Uh, maybe a few weeks you would have a tumor in your brain from your lungs, but then it would kill itself and your other cells would probably be unaffected by it. So it's all four of these things that go wrong that make cancerous really, really dangerous. <clears throat> and so I want you to think about it this way. So let's say that there's 10 genes, this isn't really true, but let's say there's 10 genes to, that have to be broken until you get cancer, like all four of these things that are involved in cancer. So maybe you're unlucky and you inherited seven broken genes from your parents. So you only have three steps to get cancer. Whereas, let's say maybe me, I'm not saying that I'm better than you or whatever, but let's say maybe I don't. I only have, I only inherited two of these broken genes from my parents. Well, that means that I, I have eight steps before I can get cancer. Now, does that mean that, that you, you, your three genes are going to get mutated so you get cancer within your lifetime? Maybe, maybe not. But if you smoke, that increases the risk of you to develop mutations. Or if you're around carcinogens, you know, there are studies that show that, that eating smoked meat can cause uh, your genes to mutate. Your diet, uh, if you're around formaldehyde, if you work at a nuclear plant, you know, all those things can lead, can cause you to get closer to getting cancer. You're only three steps away, so that's a lot closer than me. But maybe I, you know, uh, I live a super reckless lifestyle and I drink and I smoke and I work in a nuclear plant and I like to dig up radioactive uranium and play with it on weekends and all that other stuff. So that makes me much more susceptible than maybe you 
where you're super safe and you don't smoke and you don't, uh, you're not around any harmful chemicals or whatever. And so by reducing your risk of, of messing up these genes, you have a better chance of not getting cancer than I do. Or I could get really unlucky and maybe, you know, I just happen to get these genes that get mutated, uh, whereas you don't. Or maybe you do and I don't. And that's when we talk about like, do you have the breast cancer gene? Does that mean you're going to get breast cancer? No, it just means you're a step closer than someone that doesn't have the breast cancer gene to getting breast cancer. Same with prostate cancer or pancreatic cancer or any other cancer. All right, so we don't have time to go through the rest of this stuff, but I, I do want to talk a little bit about, uh, so we talked about benign versus malignant. So make sure you guys know what that means. Benign means that it's just made a tumor and malignant means that, that those cells have spread to other places. Um, and so we talked about what, what cancer is and I just, I'm, 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 there's some slides that are in here that show you how the cell cycle works. But what I wanna, I want to show you this essentially is that by looking at uh, the profiles of genes, like so, so there's 20,000 genes in every cell, and cells express genes differently. That's what makes them different cells. So, scientists are trying to study what the profile is of certain tumor cells, and that's what I did. So what we did was we took, uh, I studied breast cancer. So we took like, you know, thousands of samples of breast cancer from patients and, and looked at its genes, all 20,000 genes to see if, can you, I'm sorry, question? No, okay. So, we wanted to find out what genes were, were, were on, right? And what genes were off, because we know that genes that are turned on or off differently than, than normal cells. So we took healthy breast cancer or healthy breast tissue and, and cancer breast tissue, and we compared it. And the way we did that is, uh, by using this chip. And I'm not going to explain the whole way that this works, but the, it, it works with color. So like if there's more green here, then that's more, it's higher present in the normal cell. And if there's more red, then that gene is more, uh, has more product in the cancer cell. So if we look at uh, each one of these represents a different gene in the human body. Um, and so here I can look at this and this one is green. So that means that the level of this particular protein in, in a cancer cell is lower, right? It's higher in a normal cell because there's more green than red. <clears throat> the red one, like this one, the protein is level is higher in a cancer cell than in a normal cell. And I can go through this and I can look at all of these different spots this is the a chip that I helped develop at the National Cancer Institute. This represents, so this is a small section of this chip, a section about here, right? And this chip has all 20,000, all these 20,000 spots are different genes. And so you can, you can whittle down what cancer looks like by doing this profiling. So uh, think about it this, this way. Let's say someone stole your wallet or your purse, right? And so you would wanna catch that person to get your wallet or your purse back. So you, so the police are gonna ask you, describe who took your thing, right? And so let's say that you said they had brown hair. Well, there's a lot of people with brown hair. So that's not really gonna narrow it down very much. But then you said they had brown hair and blue eyes. Well, that's gonna be less people than just all the people with brown hair. 
And then let's say they had a tattoo on their shoulder. Well, how many people, you know, now there's less people that have brown hair and blue eyes and a tattoo. And maybe they're wearing red Nikes. Okay, well, then there's going to be less people wearing red. You guys get the idea. So imagine there's 20,000 descriptors of a suspect that you can give to the police. That's going to narrow it down to almost like maybe one person. <coughs> and that's the goal with cancer cells, because we want to be able to distinguish what a cancer cell looks like versus a non-cancer cell. And, the, and just to give you an idea, that's how big this chip is. So this is an actual penny. This is the chip. It's, it's on a slide. And I, I'm not going to bore you with the process, but it's pretty cool. Um, and the, what's the purpose of this? Well, let's imagine it this way. Let's say that it, we're in a classroom and one of the students is cancer and we want to get rid of it. We want to kill that cancer, but we don't want to kill all the other people in the class. So we target drugs specifically for people that are wearing glasses, right? And so there's going to be a few that have glasses and they're going to get a little bit of the poison, but not enough to kill them, right? And then we target the person that has brown hair. Well, some people are going to have brown hair, but only a few are going to have brown hair and glasses, right? So they get two doses of the poison. And then let's say they're wearing red shoes. Well, then they would get three doses of the poison. Some people are gonna have red shoes, but odds are they're not gonna have glasses and brown hair and red shoes. And then we, you know, we continue on to these 20,000 different units and the person that we've targeted, we know their cancer, they get 20,000 doses of the poison. Whereas the other cells maybe only get five or six. So they may feel a little woozy for a little bit, but they're going to be okay. But the cancer cell is going to be dead. And this is how cancer biology is progressing right now. We're trying to make drugs that are specific that target only the cancer cells and leave the healthy cells alone, which is way different than what's going on right now because radiation leads to mutation, right? It seems weird that you would use radiation to get rid of cancer because if you use that, what are you reintroducing? Let's say we have a tumor here and we know that we have 10 steps to get this tumor. All these cells around here are probably nine steps away. So if you shoot radiation in here to kill this tumor, what are you hitting in the, in the meantime? You're hitting the cells around that tumor that are nine steps away. And what does radiation do? it could mutate it to that 10th step. So that causes it to recur. And then we also said that we have chemotherapy drugs. And, but the, the problem with those is they target all cells that are dividing, which kind of sucks because you don't want your skin cells to die and your hair cell to fall out and to, to feel like you're eating ground glass every time you have a meal. But if we can do this, if we can do something like this profiling, we can target only cancer cells extremely specifically and only kill cancer cells. And that's the goal. All right, so I'm done with the lecture for today. Do you guys have any questions about anything so far? Um, I just have a question about the cancer part. Sure. Uh, if they narrowed it down to the cancer cell, how long would that take to actually target that cell to kill it? They were able to do it. So uh, let's, you could, you could, um, so that's a great question. If you asked me that question two years ago, I would have said five years, right? But you guys have seen how fast that we developed a, a vaccine to COVID-19. So the technology has improved tremendously in the last few years. So today, you could do this uh, specific targeting to cancer cells, you know, and, and of course we need to profile it. So you could get the profile in a day and design the drugs in probably uh, two or three months and then give it to the patient and a few doses and, and uh, the cancer cell should be dead. But there's other things that you have to remember. Remember like, 
we talked about in chapter six that the the endo, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is in charge of uh, detoxifying drugs. Well, uh, if we gave poison, that's a drug, and that would increase the resistance of cells to that drug. So there there could be issues with this, and we have to figure out how to specifically target these cells so that they take up these drugs. Um, that we're getting close to that, right, with the new technology. So maybe in the next, you know, three or four years, you would be able to go from, let's say you had a lung cancer, you went to the doctor, they would take a sample of that, profile the genes on it, figure out what the that particular tumor looks like, because they're all different, right, from every person. And then they would be able to design these drugs that target that particular cell, like the receptors on that cell, and probably kill it within, you know, a few weeks. So you could go in three weeks later, you could be cured of your cancer. We're not there yet, uh, but we're getting close. And, you know, that's, that's the goal of most cancer biologists like myself is to be able to do that, right? No matter what cancer you have. And here's something that's interesting, and I'll just tell you guys this, and then I'll, I'll quit. But so uh, tr the Translational Genomic Institute is kind of the NCI of Arizona, National Cancer Institute. And so they study a lot of cancer. And there was a guy that went in that had uh, untreatable prostate cancer. He went through all the different drugs, all the chemotherapeutic drugs, nothing worked. They did a DNA profile on his prostate cancer tumor and found out that it matched a lot of the profile of a breast cancer uh, tumor. So they gave him breast cancer drugs instead of prostate cancer drugs, and his entire cancer went into remission. So that's how powerful this profiling can be. Can I ask one other question about cancer? Sure. Um, so my grandpa, he had prostate cancer, uh -huh. and, and it had spread to his bones and his spine, I believe. Right. But he did some um, out-of-pocket treatment where they um, took his blood out and sent it to California and put, like, antibodies in it and then sent it back and put it back in his body. And apparently the cancer is gone. Do you know anything about that? <clears throat> sure. So... So let's say you have a tumor, right? You have uh, cells called T cells. They're part of your immune system. Their job is to kill uh, invaders like viruses and bacteria that get in your cells. And so some of these T cells recognize these mutated tumor cells and they try to kill them. Did you, did you ever see the movie 300? We have like the Spartans against the... Yeah. Okay, so imagine that. So like let's say that there's 300 of your T cells and they're fighting a million cancer cells. That's a losing battle. So what they do is they go in and they find these T cells in these tumors that are trying to kill them and they take them out and they put them in a Petri dish, just like I showed you guys. And then they grow them so that they get millions of these, you know, billions of these T cells and then they inject them back in. So now you've taken an army of 300 and made it a billion, and now you can win this war. And that's called immunotherapy. And it is using your own body's defense and, and helping it by increasing the number of these killer T cells to kill the cancer. And this is very also a very uh, modern way of dealing with cancer. Okay, thank you. I was curious about I never heard of it. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a very new and it's really cool. It's, you're basically just creating a massive army to kill the cancer because these T cells aren't capable of dividing the same way because they're so busy trying to fight off this cancer. When you take them out of the, out of the body, grow them in a lab and then reintroduce them, now they're like a super powerful army and they can kill the cancers. Cool, thanks. They're no welcome. Any other questions? All right, 
So uh, I'm going to go jump to office hours. And then uh, if I don't see you guys then, I'll see you on Thursday. Thank Great you. lecture. Thank you, Professor. Have a good one.